For those of you who don't know me, my name is Cindy Bank, and I'm the Associate Director of the Program in Practical Policy Engagement, and my colleague, Miriam McGarren, is on with me. And um, it's just such a great pleasure for me to welcome Eugene, um, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I, I think I met you when you were maybe a first a student, and I mean, he, he's just had such an incredible um, few years um since while he was a student and since going to dc that i thought it would be really fun to chat with him and hear about his journey um i do expect that we'll probably have some additional folks join um as this is going on but let's we're, we're going to hear from eugene and then i really hope that students and others that are on um will you know ask questions we want this to be a dialogue he's a very friendly person and if you're really lucky, he'll show you pictures of his kids who are just beyond adorable. But anyhow, <laughs> that becomes a little too personal. But anyhow, Eugene, thank you. Of course. So, thank you so much. Uh, and it's so nice to see folks. And obviously, as I was saying a little earlier, it's always so great to see Cindy. Uh, she was, uh, I think I did, we did meet when I was an undergrad. And then when she was out in DC, it was always a friendly face. And I tried to go to as many of the Michigan and DC functions as I possibly could, just because it was always nice to get a chance to, to see her and catch up. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to, don't have too much to say up top. I think I wanted to have some time for questions, but I think just first of all, just really excited and grateful that Cindy extended the invitation uh, for me to come speak. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, and, you know, part of the reason I'm excited, as I mentioned, just because of, of knowing Cindy for so long now. But, you know, honestly, I'll do anything for my alma mater. Uh, I was born in Ann Arbor. I was raised in Ann Arbor. I, Michigan was the only school I applied to for undergrad. I named my dog Blue, so I'm just uh, <laughs> as as fanatical as as they get. Um, and a big reason I'm excited is for the students for where you are in your journey. Uh, there's just so much opportunity ahead for you, so many options to consider, experiences to be had, and especially for those you know you're in the school of public policy now. But if you're planning on going into it, it's such an exciting and important thing. It's you know, I've said this before to some, you know, from folks I've got to talk to, and it's just a rare thing to get to work with people who you share a passion with, who you share moral and ethical North Stars with, and bring different skills and talents and backgrounds to that shared mission. And I miss it a lot. And the friendships I made during my time in politics remain my strongest today. I met my wife on, on the Obama campaign. My best man in my wedding sat kitty corner from my cubicle on that campaign. Uh, and a bunch of my friends from the OA campaign, we all had kids about the same age and we just signed up to hang out at the same pool this summer. It's, it, 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 you know, the, the friendships from the time in politics and in the government really are like a second family. Um, and for the students, look, you know, I'm, I'm relatively old. Uh, like the music from my high school and college days are now what's played on classic rock stations and sampled on today's song. So I'm that kind of old, um, but I'm also uh, not so far removed from a lot of the choices that you're facing and will be facing. And so I wanted to, again, leave as much time as possible for any questions or conversations. And it could really be about anything. It could be about career options and thoughts you're having about that you know, logistical things like how to move to new cities without ever visiting them before, which is something I've had to do a couple of times in my career, uh, who I think have the best wings in Ann Arbor. I have strong opinions about that. Um, stories from my time, at any one of my stops, or really anything I'd just love to, uh, and not just things anyone, I'd, you know, happy to take questions. And I think just a couple of thoughts though, before I, I started that, that dialogue and, you know, the first I just want to share a couple of thoughts of, of just sort of lessons and things that I wish I had known more or had a kind of finer point on when I was in undergrad in those first couple of years afterwards, which is the, the most important thing is, and what I already alluded to, is that working for a purpose to be a part of an engine of change in whatever small way, especially which will be small if you're when you're 23, 24, 25 in a workplace is a just a really rare 
and special thing. Uh, and the other one uh, kind of important lesson that I've learned is the importance of relationships and how relationships matter professionally and not in like a gross transactional networking way, which I think is a lot of time when relationships start to, you know, be discussed, especially when you're thinking of getting started on a career path. But what I mean by relationships is how you build trust with the people that you do work with or you do interact with, because, you know, your degree will unquestionably help you thrive in the jobs once you get them. But the getting it part and navigating those early days in a new job can be a bit of a jungle. And because part one thing I've seen again and again and again, whether it was on campaigns or in government or in the private sector is that senior people, like the ones who are doing the hiring and the staffing, they just look first toward those who they've already seen in action or worked with, people who they know they can trust to handle projects on their own, who they know are reliable, who, they, who will work quickly and work hard and ask good questions. It's just a sort of human nature. You, it's almost like people look for their security blanket at work. And so, uh, you know, that's where those relationships, especially when you're early in your career, developing those, building those, every single one of the jobs I've had came because somebody I had worked with previously was in that organization and tried to bring me on board. Uh, the only time my first job out of college was working for Amy Klobuchar Senate campaign in Minnesota in 2006. And that was the first one where that was the only one where I just sent my resume to like a thousand different places and hoped somebody would email me back and someone did. Um, and, but other than that, it's been, there's been people who either, you know, on the Obama campaign, I wanted to work there, but I knew, you know, the, my bosses from the 06 campaign were working for Obama starting in January, February of 2007. So they helped me in that job you know, getting to the White House and, you know, even going from the campaign to the transition to the White House, each one of those sort of friction points, there were a lot of my friends and colleagues who didn't get a job right away or at all with the, with the transition and certainly not get a job at the White House right away. And uh, uh, scores more who had to wait for months and months before they got a job at one of the agencies if they got one. But, at, you know, for each one, it was the people who I had worked with and those relationships that I had so built helped me in each one of those ways and where I am now in the private sector, been at the same place now for about seven years. And one of my colleagues that I worked with, he was our kind of our labor guy um, for the Obama campaign. He's the one who started working there a year and a half before I did. And he got me to come join him because he liked the work and the people. So those relationships, you never know where they're going to go, but that's, it's so important in, in the professional world I've, I've found. And, you know, again, for both this part of what I'm saying, and when we get into questions, you know, there's the caveat that I had a different path than most of you, if for no other reason than this program, especially at the undergraduate level, just did not exist when I was an undergraduate. Um, but even a lot of the senior policy folks that I know now didn't have a linear line from undergraduate or their master's programs to what they're doing today. You know, one of my best friends is the assistant secretary for policy at the Department of Transportation. And he's been a staff assistant. He's, he was a press secretary for a, a Senate campaign in North Carolina. He's been a campaign manager. So there's so many different routes in politics and in, in the policy world and uh, in, the, in public service. So you know, there's, that's where the relationships can be helpful because again, there's no, I, I know so many people who their careers are just, it's, it looks all over the map, but it's got a kind of a North star that helps guide and guide it. And I think to that end, you know, one of the things that to help build those relationships uh, and what's worked with for me, and I've seen a recipe that's worked for a lot of people is for that first job, either out of college or after undergraduate, you know, taking a job that even if it doesn't necessarily even seem necessarily like the exact job you want, or it may not be the exact sort of level or seniority that you're interested in, but it's an opportunity to start building those relationships and proving yourself. And, you know, I started 
in Chicago in 2007 on the Obama campaign as a staff assistant. And then 11 months later, I was on the road uh, and on the plane with Obama as the political aide that traveled with him. And part of that was people knew I was reliable. Part of that was I'd been around in that department long enough to know the sort of strategic priorities. And part of it was like, people just felt like I wouldn't be too weird around Obama. And so they figured it was worth the risk to see if I could kind of work the chemistry all right. And I think I, you know, so you never, there's what I've seen in public service and in, in careers that things move quickly, they're non-linear. Um, and so, it, which leads me, I think that my final point here is that every single one of those experiences I've had professionally helped me grow both personally, but professionally, and even as disparate as they have been. So, you know, I ran for city council while I was an undergrad before my senior year and knew nothing. I didn't know how to do anything, uh, how to run a campaign, how to campaign, how to deal with any of the things that came up on a campaign and just learned a lot just by doing it. Um, I learned a lot as a field organizer in Minnesota in 06, working for Klobuchar. You know, again, that job was, it's a lot of really hard grunt work. Uh, and you're the again front line of voter contact and trying to recruit volunteers for an off cycle Senate campaign is not always the easiest thing, but I learned a lot there. And then I learned a lot you know, when I worked at the White House, a lot of my job was working with the party committees with the DSCC, the DCCC, the DGA, and the DNC in the ramp up to 2010. There's everything from candidate recruitment to message development for the candidates to tiering competitive races. So the white, we could start making some decisions on resource allocation and all of that in the ramp up to just an overwhelming butt kicking where we lost like every single one of the seats that were up that year. And you know, some of you may have heard the term a wave election before and living through one is terrible. Um, but again, I learned a lot through that. So um, I think just before I turn to if anyone has any questions, I think just a quick rundown of what I've done in case it inspires a topic for conversation is, as I said, I ran for city council as an undergrad, uh, worked for Klobuchar, worked in, for Obama in various capacities from 2007 to through 2013. And since then, I've been in the private sector. Um, primarily, we advise CEOs who are navigating something that's inspiring them to look for outside help. And that's where my firm comes in. That's where I, what I do for a living is advising CEOs on any number of issues that they're dealing with. And so with that, I'd love to take any questions or uh, that you might have. It was just great, Eugene. And I think, I mean, you've touched on a number of topics I often mention when I speak with students is one, follow your passion. Yep. Um, because we spend a lot of time at work and also just the importance of, um, you know, the relationships. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, Eugene and I don't have a lot of contact over the years, but it's like, you know, if I were to see an email from him or vice yeah. versa, it's like, oh, I'm going to open this. Yeah. yeah. Right so, away. Yeah. And how important. And I would also say never underestimate the Michigan connections. Yeah. Um, blood runs blue. And yeah. um, people, especially in D.C., who have all been through what every graduate's going through looking for a job, they've been in your spot. So, yeah. And very willing to help. So I, I want, actually, I'm going to ask the first question because yeah. I was just like, um, just last week, I think, I sent you that article about, they happened to mention about um, your they mentioned you in the Michigan Daily about the city council race. And it wasn't until I read that article that I realized how the cities, um, how it's split up so yeah. that there's no one seat that represents that's heavily student. But I mean, you lost by like 75 votes or something. I mean, it was not many. No. Incredible. Yeah. And, and, you know, and uh, yes. So that was, yeah, I lost, yeah, it was, uh, I think it was somewhere between 70 and 90, somewhere in that range. It was close. Um, the, it was an interesting experience because, you know, I, I was trying to figure out that summer. I had done the Michigan Public Service Internship Program the summer before, um, which was one of the more formative experiences I've ever had. I had a great time. At that point, I was certain I was going to go to law school. So I, I interned at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in D.C., uh, but it was an incredible learning experience. And then as my junior year was going on, I was trying to think through what would be the next sort of 
I had this interest in politics uh, and wanted to learn more and always sort of follow the Ann Arbor City Council, especially its various forms of dysfunction and the sort of contentious town and gown relationship from time to time. And I thought, what better way of learning more and taking this next summer and maybe beyond than to just do it and to, you know, I have, I knew I had some benefits than other students who had run in the past, primarily just that I had grown up in Ann Arbor and that I also didn't have a very radical platform. I wasn't, you know, trying to, I, I just wanted to have a student voice on the council and to, you know, take the job seriously. And um, it was an interesting introduction because actually two of the sitting council members said, I pulled my petitions, you had to get a certain number of signatures to get on the ballot. So I pulled the signatures the next day, two of the sitting council members asked me to take me out for coffee. And at that coffee, they heavily discouraged me from running because my the, there's someone already in the primary and he had been to so the war two, which is where I ran is had been, you know, that's where Jane Lum is from. And it had been the sort of la most last of the more conservative wards in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And so they had recruited a guy who had run for mayor as Republican the previous cycle to come be a Democrat and, and run for city council, hoping that, you know, he would have an advantage there. So they were discouraging me from running. And in fact, even went so far as to say, we don't want you to jeopardize your future in the Democratic Party by, you know, and so I thought that was like a rude introduction to, you know, the, to, to, to the city politics. But, you know, I had, I would luckily because of Michigan, I had uh, a mentor, Marvin Krizloff, who at the time was the general counsel, and I had taken a class with him that was an incredible class. And he had set me up with, he had a law student who had written a big paper about student disenfranchisement in Ann Arbor to help uh, helped me learn what to do. He had worked on an AG's race back home in New York previously, so he knew something, whereas I knew nothing. Um, and so it was an incredible experience. Um, and I think I had, so that, uh, I think you'd shared that article with me, the, the history of the, how the lines were drawn. I've heard different stories of how it came to be. I, the way I'd heard it is at one point, Ann Arbor did have a sort of a downtown ward that did have, I think the last student, so the way I heard it was that the last student who had been on council at that point had come from that district back in the, I think it was 60s or early 70s. And at that point, they, after that, they redrew the maps. So basically the center point was on the union mm -hmm. so that all the students would then be dispersed through the five wards. And, you know, I, I tried at one point to door knock in the student areas of Ward 2 when I was campaigning, but it's, it's an August 4th primary date. So no one's there. Right. And if they're there, they certainly, they're either just moved in or they're just moving out. And they also didn't have any sort of, you know, voter registration at that address. So, you know, the precinct that has like Markley and those houses over there on, on, on Forest and that area that's still in, in the ward, you know, I think two people voted from that whole precinct. Um, so I had to rely completely on the on the neighborhood. So yeah, it was there are some structural issues. And one of the things that I had ran on was trying to move the city to at that point to even a nonpartisan election so we could do away with the primary because again, shades of blue are going to be who runs mm -hmm. for those seats anyway. And all that early primary was doing was making it so that students had no vote in who the city council member was ultimately going to be. That's very interesting. Very interesting. And luckily, those two council people were wrong about you. Yeah. And one of them okay. was embroiled in scandal just a few years later. So, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've got lots of questions, but who else yeah. has questions? Now, this isn't usually a shy group. Oh, okay. Ellie, please ask your question. Sure. Hi, Eugene. Thank you so much for your time. I'm a uh, MPP student, um, and I actually lived in, in DC mm -hmm. for four years before I oh, wow. came Great. here to Ann Arbor, but, um, uh, but that was uh, under a different administration, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit different. Um, uh, I'm just really curious, um, looking into your background, like what your day-to-day -day was sort of like in the Obama administration. It sounds very wide-ranging, and I'm sure it's probably not 
like the same every day, but it's, it just, your position sounded so fascinating. So I was just curious, like, what was it like day to day and what specific kinds of things were you involved in during the, during your time there? That's a great question. And um, I'll try not to go too long because uh, I, I can talk about that time of my life forever. Um, uh, so I was lucky to my point about relationships. I was lucky that they basically carved a role for me because one of the things that was very surprising for all of us who had come from the political world and like the campaign side of things is how institutionalized and rigid government structures are. Now, I'll also, as a quick aside, now that I've been in the private sector for seven years and primarily working with Fortune 100 companies, anyone who thinks that the private sector is more efficient than government is delusional. I have never encountered the sort of bureaucracies at these companies as I so one of my clients uh, is a you know is one of the major beverage uh, soda makers uh, you can tell how long it's been since I've been in Michigan that I use the word soda there I've been training when I refer to it around the house I do use pop because I don't want my kids to know the right way of referring to it but um, the I was I had a I was working with them on one of their major products and I had a proposal so I started with the, my media client team, and then I got kicked up to the vice president marketing stills for this company, North America, then brought in the vice president marketing sparkling North America. Once they gave me feedback on a deck, I then had to go to the vice president marketing still and global. And then the after that stop, the VP marketing sparkling global, then back into the North America realm to start going up to the COO who then kicked me back. So again, I was like, this was my first year after being in government. I was like, this is no better. Than, and this makes HUD look like a nimble startup. This is incredible. So, um, so when I started at the White House, I had sort of a number of different buckets that I got to work in because they kind of created a role out of the chiefs of staff's office for me where I was primarily working out of the, you know, working with the political affairs team. So. I would say about 40, 50% of my job was working with the party committees because there was a, um, there, the Hatch Act, you know, has the prohibition on political activity from government employees. But at the same time, there's one president and that president does both official duties as president, but is also the head of the party and it's one person. So they have to, there is some wiggle room in the law to be able to support the president on their political activities. And so that was sort of where I worked. And then ultimately, and we had just at the time the DOJ was working on the Office of Special Counsel when rules mattered, but the special counsel was working on clear guidelines for what the political affairs team can do, given that the Bush administration, especially Karl Rove, ran through a number of the previously acceptable guardrails on what the Hatch Act permitted federal employees to do. Um, but we, so that was probably about 40, 50% of my job was working with the party committees. Um, and then about a quarter of my job was just kind of, I call it just special situations, things that were sort of sensitive in nature that cut across different departments where like a Pete Rouse or a Mas Jim Messina or our chief of staff, Rahman would just ask me for, they would give me, here's a problem. I don't know how to fix it and it needs to be held like you need to do it discreetly so here uh so i that was about a quarter that was really interesting and you know one of my very very dear friends who is now a you know chief legal counsel for one of the largest companies in america but at the time was uh she also shepherded all of our supreme court nominees through their process but she was in the counsel's office she was my go-to lawyer um and whenever it got to a point where I, when I called her, when I got tasked with one of these things, her first, <laughs> she would pick up the, she would see my extension and say, what kind of shady blank are you getting me into today? So that was about a quarter of my job. And then the, the rest of my job was sort of just overall stakeholder engagement as we tried to build support. So you know, you know, whether it was for the budget or especially around, you know, when we're trying to get the Affordable Care Act passed, you know, every day legislative affairs team would have a list of the maybes 
And then we would work with the chief of staff's office to figure out how are we going to, what was going to be the sort of engagement strategy for each one of these members to try to get them from a maybe to a yes. And who do they have locally that we can try to get their support, who they can then um, talk to their, you know, and, you know, Rahm Emanuel is a very controversial figure, but I will say he was the right chief of staff given the legislative priorities we had because watching him in those meetings was incredible you would you know because he know he knew every one of those members so we'd sit down with that list of maybes and it would be this member and then he would say oh he listens to the pastor at this church on this street i'll call him or then the next member is oh this person there went to school with the vp of this bank that's in that district Bill is best friends with him. I'll call Bill. I'll have, like, it was just that level of detail. And all we just have to do is just execute these ideas in those meetings. So, um, but, you know, the party committee one was the one that I probably spent the most time with. And those days were just, you know, I'd get to the office probably about eight. I was leaving around probably nine or 10 usually. Um, and every day, there was no set rhythms to the day. It was just incoming sort of all day long. And I loved it. So that was what I did sort of through the midterms. And then after the midterms, as we started gearing up for the reelect, we moved the political department to the DNC for a host of reasons, most of them optics. Um, but we, a few of us stayed behind to be a sort of shadow political unit. And so, and at that point, the OLC opinion on what political activity was allowed had come out. So they made, they kept a few of us behind you know, council's office designated about six of us as allowed to interact with the re-election campaign. And I was there, so just traveling with the president from stop to stop to be able to bridge the gap between what we needed to do from an official duties perspective and what we needed to do from the political side. It was great. Again, my friendships, my marriage. At one point, my wife and I were working across the hallway from each other at the EEOB. She was a vetting attorney. And uh, so, you know, everything came from from that period of time it was an incredible uh, dynamic place to work and i have to say that um just also i know the obama um, white house had such strict um ethics guidelines because i yeah. had friends who worked there and you know if one one young friend you know nick colvin yeah um occasionally nick and i would get together for lunch and like let me buy you lunch he said no i can't you know and it but we had an established relationship but yeah, yeah but still it was just like okay no not a problem <laughs> yeah yeah caesar's web was supposed to be above reproach which obviously was very much handled the same way in the 45th president right. administration right, right. but it was uh yeah it was you know and even then, we, I think, still fell short sometimes of what we aspire to do. And I know President Biden's, their ethical, their ethics guidelines are even stricter wow. than what we had in the Obama administration. So they're really trying to curb that revolving door even more. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I was thinking about, you talked a little bit about your, um, yeah, I, I mean, you talked a lot about being on campaign. And through my experience of so, Sometimes, you know, sometimes campaign workers make great policy workers. Yeah. Other times they don't. Um, and there's, you know, there is, while politics gets involved with policy, it's a very different yeah. type of work. Um, do you have anything? I mean, a lot of our students do end up on political campaigns, which is a great way to get their foot in the door. Yeah, absolutely. So any advice on? Yeah, and, you know, there's always room especially for a statewide or a, a federal campaign for uh, there's there always will be a policy team on the campaign. To me, I think po policy and communications are the places that transfer the easiest from the campaign mm -hmm. to governing. And so they seem to, you know, because those jobs exist in both places and because those sort of rhythms of how do you sell a piece of legislation, how do you craft it or a policy, that is sort of you're in the ideation stage on the campaign and you have to run on it and then you try to action it once in office regardless of the you know which office it is so i always feel like that's a, a good path for folks who are in a policy like in the policy program would be to try to and those are tough to get right i think our policy team on the obama campaign there was i think like four or five full-time staffers and that was it and then the rest was a network of um 
policy experts that, that they'd broken out by subject areas that they would call on to help. So they were really, if anything, helping facilitate the conversations and merging what they were hearing with for the values of candidate, you know, the, at the time, Senator Obama and, and forging a sort of a, what the campaign platform was from that. And then I think, you know, depends on the candidate in some cases, right? I mean, President Obama was intimately involved with the policy process on the campaign side. Um, and he was, you know, obviously once in office, he kept very close eye on the domestic policy council and national, you know, the, the constellation of policy teams that exist at the, at the White House, so. Um, which, were, which were run by Wolverines. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so there was a heavy Wolverine influence, especially that first term. Right. Um, but, you know, and so that is, and so I think there's, that is, I think, a, but to your point, there's, it, this, the rhythms are a little different, but um, generally, the, the, the skills, especially on the, if you can get one of those communications or policy jobs, those skills transfer from the campaigning world to the governing side pretty well. Um, and what about transferring your policy government experience to the private sector now? So, you know, that has been interesting. And most of it is just sort of on a, you know, most of what I do is on a communications perspective. Um, and helping companies and, and my clients figure out better messaging and or, or sort of narratives okay. about, you know, part of what I want, part of why I wanted to do this and go into the private sector in the first place and why I chose Tanea was, I felt like there's a whole vocabulary of, in, in the private sector, I did not know um, about shareholder value and sort of what are priorities for investors and you know, that whole apparatus, which really drives so much of the economic picture quarter over quarter, felt very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. And it felt like also a very important just piece of just our day to day, how decisions are made. So I wanted to learn more about that. And I think, you know, the sort of concepts of how to communicate, how to manage a crisis or an issue, those were directly related, you know, one to one. Um, and then a lot of it has just really learning the vocabulary of what um, of, of the private sector and, and sort of how decisions get made and what what are the sort of key priorities of different executive teams. Um, and it can be all across the board. Sometimes, you know, the companies we advise are very purpose and values focused and those make it easier to give them good advice. Sometimes they're, you know, usually it's more the CEOs have aligned values, but they are very risk averse about, you know, they've spent their career as an engineer or as a chemist or whatever it is that got them from where they started to being the CEO of that company. And so then they're very risk averse. And I think, you know, especially the last few years and especially two years ago uh, when, you know, Black Lives Matter and social justice became something that companies just really had to have a position on it. And mm -hmm. if for no other reason than if you ever wanted to have a young person work for your company ever again, but just practically for, you know, they're given their influence in the marketplace. So that where it was where I actually, it was very, it was, my previous experience and my work experience came in very valuable there because frankly, I could speak Democrat, which was something that any number of our clients needed help understanding, you know, where was, they understood the risk if, you know, if they went, if, you know, if they spoke out, but they, what they didn't understand was what was the opportunity and the risk from the other side uh, of the ledger from folks who were expecting more from the companies uh, versus expecting less. Right. Did that answer your question, Gail? So Gail works with all of our BA students. She's the career person for afterwards. So, yeah. And Ellie, you said you were in DC. I want to know what you were doing there. And yeah. Are you, are you saying <laughs> going back? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I worked um, for almost four years for the U.S. Soccer Foundation, oh, cool. um, not related to the Federation, which... <laughs> It's failed terrible. to yeah failed yes. to pay its women so <laughs> um but i uh but uh, jim messina was actually on our board so oh, we're, funny that really you cool. mm -hmm. um but uh 
yeah, he, he's a really great guy. Um, but I was curious, you mentioned, um, the, uh, 2010 midterms and I was wondering like, cause obviously you're, uh, you were involved in messaging a lot and in currently in your career also, like how did that change, uh, in the loss of so many democratic seats in, in the house, how did that change the way that you did your job? Like after, cause I was obviously, uh, pretty, I mean, it was largely due to the, to the affordable care act, but like the, um, but how did that change sort of the way that you interacted with the president and how your just generally how your your work changed after the the midterms then we weren't that part of my job that was about building stakeholder support for legislative agendas sort of went away because there wasn't a legislative agenda at that point you know at that point it was the final sprint for the Obama for the affordable care act so you know right off the heels of that just miserable work experience in terms of just the outcome the, then they had the special election for um, Senator Kennedy's seat in Massachusetts that January, where Martha Coakley ran the worst can like literally a textbook definition of a terrible campaign. Mm-hmm. I still, there were, so we started sounding the alarm bells internally in early January. And then we finally got the powers that be in the White House to be like, oh yeah, this is like a problem. And then, um, it got to a point that there was what the week that we thought we were like we, we this is a problem so then we were like we need to get in touch with her we gotta get in touch with the campaign manager for a week we couldn't get in touch with the attorney general because she was on vacation three weeks before her special election she took a week off the trail and could not be reached she just went completely out of pocket and i'm a big believer in self-care but maybe not then when the <laughs> balance of the united states senate rests on your shoulders uh, and then she comes back from vacation and then she gave maybe the most almost comically wrong thing to say. So Scott Brown was a very good retail politician and was going everywhere. Uh, and he had just done a thing where he stood in front of Fenway Park and was shaking hands and handing out donuts and doing the, you know, he was running a really strong retail campaign. And they were, and, you know, Martha Coakley was doing one, maybe two events a day. She was ending her day by 5 p.m. every day. And we were like, this is not how you win a statewide race. And then, and she's getting really snippy about all of the, all of this and what we we're asking her to do. And, and then the reporters were asking about her light campaign schedule. And then she said, what do you expect me to do? Stand outside in the cold outside Fenway talking to voters? And we're like, yeah, that's actually exactly what the expectation is that you would be doing. And why would you find a way to insult the one biggest cultural landmark that cuts across party in your state? So anyway, so that was that was hard. Uh, and that was honestly one of the few times, you know, I would say one of the things about President Obama that was incredible was, and Mrs. Obama too, was they never ever yelled at their staff, which isn't necessarily commonplace in offices in DC, never raised a voice. Um, you know, Obama's way of making you feel the weight of your mistakes wasn't was not through temper but his voice would get very quiet and he would get very close and then he would ask sort of a series of questions like did you consider this did you think about that did you think through this thing so sort of the socratic method basically for your mistake and it was terrible because obviously no i hadn't thought about these things because otherwise i wouldn't have done it that way um but the one time, the, the closest he ever got to MAD was the day after we lost that Massachusetts special election. Where he was just like, do I have to do everything? Like, you, I can't even trust you guys to win a race in Massachusetts. Um, but so that, you know, the, the legislative agenda became less of a priority for me. But at that point, I was already starting to turn attention toward the reelect anyway. So that was just the sort of natural, my job was shifting sort of independently of what we're trying to get done legislatively. Whatever. 
So, um, I mean, we're heading into a mid-year election. Yeah. Term. It's going to be bad. Oh, don't say that. Um, <laughs> it's just hard. I mean, you know, the elections we've seen. So Virginia and New Jersey were good bellwethers for us in 09. You know, Virginia did nominate the world's worst candidate for its group for for governor in 2009. Uh, State Senator Cree Deeds, he somehow came out of that primary and he was completely not ready for prime time. But, you know, Christie won big in New Jersey that that cycle. Uh, Bob McDonald won big in Virginia that cycle. And it sort of was a preview of a very inspired Republican electorate, which is what I think what we saw this past year and then you know the the big warning signs in 2010 started coming in in the fall where you know we had our list of the most vulnerable democrats and we're trying to steer party resources toward them that list kept expanding bigger and bigger and then we started seeing polling in late september october for six seven term incumbents who hadn't faced a real race since their second race and they were at like 37, 38, 39% approval. And because they hadn't ever run a competitive race before, they had like $15,000 cash on hand. So we were like, oh no, like every new poll, like I remember it, it was just like, oh no, we're gonna lose. Like if this is happening to the seven term incumbents, like we're gonna lose everything. And then we lost everything. So it's just hard, the part, it's just hard especially given the dynamics i think it's going to be hard it's going to be a hard map this cycle for us well and um i mean we're again focusing a lot of attention um on campus through some programs on voter registration yeah we've actually worked um on a number of programs very close with the group um what's it called that did the um redistricting yeah here so it's been very interesting to learn more about those processes um, here and of course being a, st a student based voting and being able to do same same day registration yes. that they couldn't do when you ran and huge that. difference and then also you have a really deep democratic bench statewide which is not something we had in 2010 uh, when we were running right so it was that was the open that was um Granholm had been term limited out. So it was an open seat. And so it was a very different environment in Michigan versus having, you know, such a strong and impressive governor and attorney general and secretary of state to help inspire folks in the state. We just didn't have that right. um, in 2010. Yeah. Ali, do you have more questions? I don't want to. No, you can ask whatever you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. I mean, I'm taking a, I actually just finished my class. It was half semester um, on uh, healthcare reform in the US. And um, obviously you were probably quite involved with that um, given uh, it was in the first half of the Obama administration. Um, and I think going back to the, the, the 2010 midterms and stuff, like the good, the death panels and the, yeah. like that really killed a lot of, uh, Democratic campaigns, even if they were re-election campaigns, yep. um, even though it wasn't true. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so I, I just thinking, I've been deep in the uh, Affordable Care Act for <laughs> the last, <laughs> the last, I don't know, seven weeks, eight weeks. So yeah, that's, it's just Amazing. really interesting to hear your, your perspective on uh, uh, especially when you mentioned the ACA, it was, that was very cool. So, yeah, that's, um, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> you know, and, and honestly that whole, the, it was not a policy debate. It was trying to win. What could we get Max Bacchus to agree to? That is essentially what it all became about. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was infuriating. And then Joe Lieberman came in at the 11th hour to make things even worse. Uh, and boy, that was, real frustrating <laughs> it's not like all the things that the the rest of the party was upset that wasn't in the bill it's not like we didn't want them in the bill it was max Bacchus had drawn some clear lines foolishly and naively thinking that this sort of cobbled together compromise would be able to win one or two votes from his 
Republican colleagues, but you know, even the Tea Party and that also seems a little quaint to me compared to some of the what's happening right now. But um, yeah, it 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 was. It's interesting to hear. I love to hear anything else you learned from that class because it just sounds. You know, it was such a living it. You know, you don't get a chance to like think about it. You're just kind of going from fire drill to fire drill about it. But that was a big thing to me. It was God, why can't we get Max Bacchus to do something? There are some shades of familiarity with what's going yeah. on right now. Yeah. With Manchin and Sinema. But um, yeah. Manchin was a great governor, right? Like when he was the governor of West Virginia, he was a good governor. He was popular. He actually tried to get stuff done. And then he just got like senatoritis. Like he just <laughs> loves being a senator so much that he can't remember where his North Stars ever were. Mm -hmm. And it's befuddling. Yeah. And Kristen Cinema also, I don't understand her political instincts right now, given the nature of her state and what she ran on and where the state is going. It's from my lens, sort of political malpractice from her staff to let her kind of waffle the way she has. Would have been interesting to watch. I want to give a shout out to Dennis Powers, who's on here. Your Ellie, other questions this time? No. No, Eugene, that's it. it. Anybody well, else? Tracy. Tracy had the um, put her on the spot. She had the, the pleasure <laughs> of meeting Eugene when she got to um, meet with President Obama. Um, Eugene was her handler, her wrangler. You called her. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it was fun to have that Ann Arbor connection. Was yeah, it was great. Time. It was great to see um, Eugene again. And that was such an exciting time. And I was fortunate. I worked as a, I taught in Ann Arbor for um, over 25 years and then retired. And uh, now I'm working for the Education Policy Initiative at the Ford School as a cool. kind of retirement job. Um, but I was a classroom ambassador fellow for the U.S. Department of Education. So I was super lucky in 2012 to be Arnie Duncan's guest along with um, the Dean of the School of Education. Um, and I met Eugene very early in the morning. I was like the first one yeah. <laughs> at the event because I was so excited. Um, and you know, and, and I kept asking him, I'm like, I, I didn't believe until I actually was shaking his hand with the picture that I was really going to meet. It's all very quick. Um, but Eugene was wonderful and it's just so great to see him again. Great to see you. And Ari Duncan, one of the all-time great secretaries of education, I think, of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, and look at what he's done afterwards. You know, he could have done literally anything he wanted. And that he went back home to Chicago is a testament to kind of, of him. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Like I said earlier, I can hardly wait to come to Ann Arbor and I can see I know. you. And I can meet your kids <laughs> in person because they're so cute. And um I know Gail will share a lot of this wisdom she learned from you with the BA class. Um, and Ellie, it's been such a pleasure. I'm glad you joined. And uh, some of our other students messaged when they had to get off. I know. I was. I'm, I'm shocked that I had this much time. <laughs> so thank you so much. I really. Of course. It. And again, because you stuck it out. Again, if when if you ever, you know, Cindy has my contact information. So if you ever have any follow ups or anything, you have questions about, or you're coming back to DC, let me know. Thank you. That'd be great. Um, so great to see you. Go blue. As always. And um, thank you everybody for joining us. Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye.